Can you see my PowerPoint okay? Okay. So for this exam one review session, it will cover intro, chem, cells, histology, and integumentary. Um, did all of you get a chance to take a look at the announcements where it walks through kind of how to prepare for exam one? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. If you haven't, please make sure to um, go through that. So some logistics for this. So for the lecture exam, it will be 50 questions. It covers all of those topics that we talked about below. Okay, and essentially it's gonna be divided relatively even. So there's one, two, three, four, five. So there's five chapters. which means you can expect about 10 questions per chapter. And that's why when students ask me, is there something that you should study more, focus on? Not really. Um, your exam is set up so that it's randomized and it's gonna randomize 10 questions from intro, 10 questions from cell, from chem, 10 questions from cell, 10 questions from histology, and 10 questions from integ. So really, there isn't something that we say, oh, okay, you need to focus on this one. You know, kind of everything we've given you is is fair game, okay? So there are 50 questions, um, 10 in each of the chapters. And within those 50, 40 of them are multiple choice. And those are the set of questions you'll see first. The last 10 questions are fill in the blank. Okay. And like Anna asked, it could be like, here's this definition, give me um, what this definition is for. Okay, so the fill in blank isn't like a sentence long. You just need to fill in like a word, two words, three words, depending on what the question is. Okay, you won't have to write out, like I wouldn't say define this and you have to type in the, all of that, okay? So fill in the blank is very short. It's like one to two words, um, sometimes three, but just read the questions and they do appear last, okay? Um, you wanna, so that's the, the lecture. And then for the lab, it's going to be 30 questions. Oh, how long do you have to take the lecture? Exactly, thank you, Ashley. How much time? You have 50 minutes. Okay. So about one minute per question. I will tell you this, this stresses people out all the time, but when I looked at it, students in general take anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes. Okay, so that's the average trend is that students tend to take about 30 to 40 minutes, okay? Um, I do recommend that if you notice you finish early, don't go out, kind of go back and look at your answers. Um, if you have time, go back and look at your answers, but you should spend enough time on each question so that you don't have to go back, okay? Um, but you do have 50 minutes. It doesn't seem like a lot, one minute per question, but trust me, average shows that students take a lot less time than the 50 minutes allotted, okay? All right, so for lab, there are 30 questions. All 30 are fill in the blank. And essentially, they're just a larger version of your quizzes. How your quiz appears, that's how your lab exam is going to appear. Okay, so they're all fill in the blank. Um, and I'm not sure if you notice this or not, but if there's any image that seems small and you, you just can't make it out, if you press control, uh, CT, sorry, let me redo that. C T R L plus, it will zoom in. Okay, if you press Control plus, it should zoom in, and then if you need to zoom out, you press Control minus, and that's to zoom out. Okay. Any questions on the lecture or the lab? Oh, how how long do you have on the lab? Forty-five minutes. Okay, so you have a little bit more time on the lab, 
per question than you do on the lecture because the lab is um, the lab is all fill in the blank. So and I we recognize it takes more time to type in your answers. So we've given you more time on the lab. Yes, absolutely, John. Okay. So then the logistics for both of these exams. Okay. I highly recommend that you take the practice quiz. That's available anytime, as many times as you want. And the reason why you want to practice with the practice quiz is because it just makes sure that your computer setting is correct. Because you don't want to go actually into the exam and figure out that, you know, you get kicked out because something wasn't working. Okay. So for both lecture and lab exam, you need to have Respondus Lockdown Browser. And that's a given. Um, browser. That's been true for all of your quizzes as well. But in addition to that, for your quizzes, it was optional, but for this, it is required for you to have the webcam on. I know some people are nervous of being recorded, but I'll, I will be honest with you. I don't even watch any of these unless Respondus flags you down. If Respondus flags you down, then I have to go in and kind of watch it, okay? And that's why part of the webcam is the environmental scan. The environmental scan is meant to protect you. So for example, um, if you go onto the announcements page, I linked an example of what environmental scan looks like. In an environmental scan, you're gonna wanna scan, I wanna see kind of what's in front of you, what's behind you, and what's around your table more importantly, okay? So when you scan your, your test taking area, don't just show me Sometimes students just scan up and down in their body. I'm like, I, I, I don't need to know that. I need to know around your desk that there's nothing around you, there's nothing behind you, and there's nothing in front of you. And again, I don't watch these unless you you are you are flagged by respondents. Okay. And if you're flagged by respondents, it's these environmental scans that will that will protect you and say and to let me know that there was nothing around you. So I don't have to watch the rest of your recording of your videos at all because I knew you had nothing around you. Okay, so two things. One, I never watch any of the videos unless Respondents Lockdown flags you or if there's like a history where I have to be more attentive um, to potential academic integrity, disintegrity. And two, the environmental scan really is meant to protect you. So if you do get flagged, I can see, okay, to the right on her table, to the left on her table, to in front of her and behind her, there's nothing. So even if she, you know, if even if respondents flags you, there's nothing around you. Okay, so be as thorough as you can on the environmental scan, um, and don't make me question whether you, you know, there was academic dishonesty if the respondent should flag you. Okay. Um, let's see. <clears throat> what would you do if you have technical difficulties? That's a great question. If you have technical difficulties, text me. Don't email me, just text me. You should all have my cell phone number. Um, log off right away so that it doesn't keep adding time against you. Um, and that's why another benefit to not looking at the questions before you answer them, I'll go on to your, so if you have technical difficulties, log off, text me right away. I'll go on and I will see what questions you viewed and which questions you have not viewed. If you've seen a question, I cannot let you redo that question. So I can only start from the part where you have not seen, and I'll try to I'll try to go in and set it so that you can complete it. If you know it seems like it was a technical issue and not just like something, you know, that's not beyond your control occurred. Okay. So if you have a technical issue, it's you know, log off right away, text me and I will go in and see what can be done, okay? But this is, again, it, you know, it would have to be a technical issue. Um, let's see, did that answer your question, Matt? Uh, question, let's see, I use a tablet with wireless keyboard mouse and it has a stand to hold it. Uh, the tablet, unless, I know that you can't use iPads, to take the exam. So if it's more of a computer device, then, um, and it has stand to hold up, would that be flagged? It shouldn't. 
um, when you say log off, does that mean press submit? Um, if you have technical issues, you it shouldn't you sh you wouldn't even have the option to press submit because it would f either freeze or something would happen, and in which case just close out completely. Like press that X. It's like a two in one. Um, so yep. So if your laptop is like a two in one where it's detached. Um, it shouldn't flag you, but even if it did, just do that thorough environmental scan and you're covered. Okay. All right. So, yep. So make sure that environmental scan be as thorough as possible because that's going to be what, you know, will protect you against potential um, academic disintegrity um, issues. Okay. Let's see. What else? Any questions? I think I covered everything in terms of the logistics, response lockdown, webcam, environmental scan. Um, and I should also say that if you are flagged and you do not have an appropriate environmental scan, I can't even let you retake the exam. You just have to take a zero for that one, okay? So just do that environmental scan for me. Um, have nothing around you that could be questionable and you should be good to go. All right. Uh, I have a question real quick. Yes, ma'am. Like on my desk, I have like, um, like my jewelry on it, and I can probably move it, but it's just kind of heavy. Is that like okay? And that's okay as long as there's no papers, no textbook, um, papers beyond that scrap paper that you have that you'd have to show me front and back. Um, yeah, yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Yeah. So for the self scan, um, my desk is in the same desk as my boyfriend's, and when I do my my scan, his computer's in the background. Would you rather me go somewhere where there is no computer, or would that be okay? That's a great question. Um, it depends. Is his computer like right next to your computer? No, ma'am. It's um, it's okay. like in the corner. Um, like I don't like if I do the self the self turn like where I show you left and right, you can mm -hmm. see the computer. Um, but if anything, I can make sure it's like off. But I can yeah. always go to a, like another room or something. I just I just don't want to get flagged. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. As long as it's not in your immediate area, you should be fine. As long as you can't like reach over and type something in it, essentially. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. How do we know if we're flagged? Respondents will let you know. It'll, it will, it usually shows like a, a little red over your exam. Yeah. I'll say like, you're not in the, in the picture, in the view, your face is not in the view, make sure you're staying in um, and so on. And sometimes um, when you're taking the exam, sometimes it, it will flag you, but again, as long as your env environmental scan is is cool, I, I don't really care. Um, it, it's The environmental scan is really important, essentially, okay? All right. Um, exam information, we kind of went through that. Content, time frame. Um, oh, I need to update that. We changed that to 45 minutes now for the lab. Respond is the importance of spawn is troubleshooting. If anything happens, don't wait until the last minute to take the exam, first of all. Like if you're taking it at 11 p.m. on Monday, I can't help you because I may be asleep or, you know, so don't wait until the last minute to take the exam. Stay calm and just text me. And then we'll resolve it um, as much as we can. My recommendation is to do the five-day study plan. So kind of... Um, back to Juliet's question, it's a lot of content. So you don't want to study it all in one day. So if you do the five-day study plan that I've attached um, to the announcements page, that should help you divide up, you know, one chapter per day. In terms of studying, don't just read your notes, okay? You want to do as much active um, strategies as possible. So it's about studying, but also reviewing, find, finding out what you know from what you don't know. Flashcards are good for that. Uh, redoing your, uh, redoing those worksheets or those study guides are good for that. Study, there are two, two strategies. Um, usually I go with studying the oldest material first because that's the one that's furthest from your memory. So reviewing the oldest material, 
other strategies would be to study the hardest material first. In other words, the ones that you don't understand, study that rather than studying things that you already know and are comfortable with. When you're studying, study the complete chapters. Don't skip around. That's going to be so confusing. And you, you, it, you know, just be really careful not to skip around chapters. Um, so when, if you're studying one chapter, stick to that one chapter. Because if you skip around, it's going to be very confusing and hard for you to pull the information out. Because doing well in this class, it takes three parts. Okay. It takes your studying. And that's going to lay the information into your brain. You have to review, which helps you to kind of pull out that information. Sometimes, I, even I experience this. I'm taking an exam and I'm like, I know this stuff, but I can't recall it. And that's because you have to practice that only putting in the information, but you have to practice taking out the information. So that's reviewing your quiz would help you do that. Doing the worksheets without any notes will help you do that to kind of figure out what you know from what you don't know. Flashcards would help you do that. And then the last part is test taking strategies. And I, there's a video on test taking strategies to kind of help you as well. Use process of elimination. Um, don't look at the answer options. Try to answer them before you go through them. And we'll do a little practice with that. I'll have some um, practice questions at the end of this session and we'll practice using test taking strategies on those, okay? So do hang on until the end if, if you have time, okay? All right, so we'll start going through the content. And again, I'm, I'm gonna go through these really briefly because you have um, you have the videos on them. But if there's something in here that you feel like you need more information on, let me know, okay? So in the intro chapter, you talked about scientific method. Make sure you know those terms and definitions. Be able to define what anatomy and physiology is. Understand the levels of hierarchy, like what's an atom, what's a molecule, what's an organelle, what's a cell, tissues, organ, organ system, and organism. So for example, I can ask you, what's the smallest living um, level of hierarchy? What would you say? Atoms. Mm -mm. Listen to the question carefully. What's the smallest living level of hierarchy? Yes, a cell, okay? So that's a great example, Juliet, because if you're if you're not reading the question carefully, you can jump to, you know, what's the smallest overall, which is, you're right, an atom. An atom is the smallest unit, okay? But it's not the smallest li living unit. And that's why when you're taking the exam, I would recommend, for me at least, I'm just telling you from my experience, it helps me to read the questions out loud to slow down and for my brain to process the question fully. Because sometimes if I read it just in my head, I'll jump to what I think the question is and then select the incorrect answer because I didn't really look at the question carefully. So reading things out loud on the exam will help you, okay? <clears throat> um, another type of question I can ask you from this is, okay, so you have DNA, you have carbon, you have the heart, and you have the digestive system. Okay, and I can say, okay, put that in the order of lowest to highest. What would you say was the lowest? Carbon, yep, so carbon would be number one. What would number two be? Carbon would be number one because it's an atom. DNA would be number two because that's a molecule. Keep going. Heart would be number three because that would be an organ. Yep. And that would make this number four. So I'd give you options like DNA, carbon, heart, digestive system, carbon, DNA, heart, digestive system, digestive system, heart, carbon, DNA, so on, because it's multiple choice, right? A, B, C, D, E. And you would look for the one that that states carbon first, then DNA, then the heart, and then the digestive system. So that's the type of question that goes beyond memorization. And you would expect to see a few of those scattered throughout the exam. So we have lower thinking questions that's just regurgitation, knowing what definitions are and just being able to place things. Other ones are a little bit more critical thinking like the one that I just gave you where you have to think through, okay? 
<clears throat> digestive is last because it's an organ system. Correct. Yep. Okay. Then make sure you know homeostasis. Okay. In this chapter, homeostasis is going to kind of give you the foundation to be able to learn all the other chapters. So you know there's going to be questions on homeostasis. So make sure you understand the ability to maintain stable internal environments, knowing what's the difference between negative feedback versus positive feedback, um, knowing some of the examples. Like I could have a test question that goes, what, are, what is an example of negative feedback or what's an example of positive feedback? So knowing what examples those are. And then, of course, there's lots of terms in the intro chapter that you should just memorize. Flashcards are great for this or quizlets. Okay. Chemistry, for me at least, chemistry is really difficult. So I would always set aside more time to study chemistry. So for you, whatever you find most difficult, make sure you set aside more time to study that. <clears throat> with chemistry, <clears throat> excuse me. With chemistry, start out with the terms. There's lots of terms in here. What's an atom versus what's an ion versus what's a cation, what's an anion, what's molecule, solute, solvents, lots of terms. So make sure you know those, okay? So, and use some mnemonics or anything that helps you. So for example, ions are charged particles. There are two types of ions. There's cation and anion. So if you can't remember which is positive, which is negative, I come up with things like this. Cation has a plus in it right here. The T creates that plus. That means cations are what? Negatively charged or positively charged? Are you going to use the periodic? I am not. And I will not require you to memorize the periodic table either. Um, you do, you are responsible for knowing, for example, if I put C, you need to know that that's what? <clears throat> Carbon, H, hydrogen, O, oxygen. So you need to know in that, in chapter two in chemistry, I do go through the 11, I believe important atoms in the human body, you need to know what those are, okay? So there's 11 important atoms that make up the human body. So make sure you know what the abbreviation, what the full name is, okay? But I wouldn't say, okay, in order to calculate whether it's neutral or stable, tell me how many um, electrons are in carbon. If I'm, if I'm making you do, do those calculations, I will always say this atom has this many, so on and so on. So I will give you the numbers in order for you to do the calculations, but you do need to know what these symbols mean, okay? Molecules, um, make sure you know the difference between stable and neutral. Um, know the chemical bonds, ionic, covalent, hydrogen. So for example, I could ask you, what is the strongest bond, chemical bond? What's the strongest chemical bond? Covalent, very good. Or I can say, um, what, what bond is due to transfer of electrons? What chemical bond is due to transfer of electrons? Ionic, excellent, okay? Make sure you study the pH scale. What's the range for the pH scale? What's the range? From zero to 15, so you're real close, okay? From zero to, so zero to 14. Zero being what? and 14 being what, and then in between, which is seven being what? And again, feel free to unmute if you can, or you can put into the chat. Zero is acidic, seven is neutral, and 14 is basic, very good, okay? So pH, let's look at this, the term pH. P means the logarithm, and in math, logarithm is inverse. So if it's a really large amount, it's actually a really small number, okay? So the logarithm and H stands for what element? It's a measurement of what? What element?
Hydrogen. Eight. Thank you. It's a measurement of hydrogen. Okay. So it tells you kind of how to use it, right? If P means the log, which is the inverse, H means the hydrogen. So the more hydrogen there is, the what the value? The lower the value or the higher the value? So the oh, more, right. yes. So the more hydrogen ions you have, the lower the scale it would be. So as it goes downwards, has the number of lowers, it actually tells you that there's more hydrogen ions. Okay. And if it the higher it goes up, there's less hydrogen ions. And instead, there's hydroxide. Okay. All right. And then the organic compounds. So make sure you do that cognitive map. Cognitive map is a really nice way of showing through visuals how things are related to each other. And that's why I had you do that for one of your assignments, right? Because remember, doing well in this class, you have to put the information into your brain when you're studying. Compare sentence, paragraph long of cer certain things versus a, a map. So your brain's going to be able to understand and remember this map more than it can the paragraph form. And that's why doing cognitive maps, it's a really good, effective way of studying because you, your brain can go, oh, I remember that picture. In the first column, I had monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. And what was what were they? Ah, they're a type of carbohydrates. And under monosaccharides, I had glucose and so on. Okay, so doing these visuals really help pull out information from your store your store the information and also pull it out when you need it on an exam okay all right so that's chemistry so here's another example of a cognitive map you've already created your own okay what about the organic compound what about the organic do we have to know the composition of them how many chains nah so you i will that's more chemistry than i require you to go so essentially here's a chart that i created for you already that's a great question ariel so you can see that you create your own chart. You know the function, for example, energy source, energy storage, cell structures, and then the types. So monosaccharides, there's only one molecule of carbohydrates under there. There's glucose, fructose, galactose. Disaccharides, there's two molecules, kind of what you did already for your, um, your sheets, okay? Um, a sample test question might be, okay, which of the following polysaccharide can you ingest but cannot be digested? What would you say? Which polysaccharide can you ingest but not digest? Cellulose? Yeah, exactly. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So then moving on to cells. So I create... I, provide this for you, but you've already made your own. So you can add on to this or you can use your own that you already created. Um, cells, make sure you know the structure and function. Everyone did really good, a good job. And some of you were super creative. I was so impressed with your videos. Uh, but structure and function, plasma membrane, um, this tends to be the most difficult for students. So make sure you spend an, a lot of time on this one. You can also even draw yourself examples. to demonstrate these types of movements. So if it's passive, it's either diffusion, and oftentimes we see the term simple diffusion, facilitate diffusion, osmosis, or filtration, and then active could either include vesicle transport in form of exo and endocytosis, or just plain active transport, okay? And then know the organelles. And again, um, you did a really nice video on the organelles, okay? Oh, your videos should all have comments on them. Make sure you view the comments because there were some mistakes that you made and it, that's perfectly fine. You rather have me catch your mistakes on these videos than on the exam. So make sure you do look at the comments that I made um, to correct your studying, that you're studying the correct thing, okay? Here's another example of a way you can use to study it. So to actively determine whether you know it or not, just try it out draw it out and label it and not only label but put their functions next to it and then pull out your notes and say oh I got this one wrong I got this one wrong this one was right but it didn't have all the information okay so 
this is this is how you would do it. So you would draw you would do this without your notes. And then you would use your notes to verify what did you get right, which what did you get wrong, or what wasn't fully in in there. Okay. Then for tissues, histology, same thing, structure and function. One of the biggest concepts that I want you to leave this class with is that structure is always connected to function. There's a reason why it's structured the way it is. So that's why if there's a structure, that's always means that there's a function associated with it. Okay. Make sure you go through the four types of tissue, epithelium, connective, muscular, and nervous. Um, in this chapter, we really focus on epithelium and connective because later chapters, um, there's a chapter on muscular tissue alone and there's a chapter on nervous tissue alone. So that's why we focus on this one and this one. I provide very little information. You still need to know the little information that I provide. <laughs> Excuse me. But we will be going through these two in more details uh, in their specific chapters. So for epithelium, do cognitive maps. Those are very helpful. Connective especially. Connective can be a little bit overwhelming because there's so many of them. Doing cognitive maps will help you with that. And here's an example. Okay. So here's the different types of tissue. And I show that one type is epithelium. Here's some basic characteristics of it. When we classify it based on simple and stratified. Then under nervous, this is all I have nervous in the green right there. Um, pretty much just know what the characteristics are, what's the function, that there are two types. There's neurons and neuroclial, and I, I draw out a neuron. And then for muscular, again, you should know the characteristics, the function, and it's based on whether it's voluntary or involuntary, stratified or non-stratified, and I would draw the examples. So the first one would be skeletal. The middle one is um, cardiac because it has the, the intercalate disc, and the last one is smooth. And you can see that the bulk of this of this image is on connective. So connective, I should know that the characteristics, the functions, and that they're all based on what type of cell they have, what ground substance, and what fibers. So if they're fibrous, they could be areolar, reticular, dense, regular, dense, irregular. If they're loose, they're either adipose or blood, and other being bone and cartilage. <clears throat> okay. Questions? Okay, so try to make this map kind of on your own to figure out what you know from what you don't know, and then use your notes to fill in what you don't know and then study that, okay? Then we have the integumentary system. <clears throat> in the integumentary system, we have, again, structure and function. Make sure you know information about the skin, but also the nail and the hair, even though we do focus mostly on the skin, okay? So on the skin, make sure you know the layers, what's cutaneous membrane versus what's subcutaneous. The worksheet that I assigned would be very helpful. If you haven't done it yet, I highly recommend that you do the worksheets. And the key to this is that you should do the worksheets twice. So when you do the worksheets, the first time that you do it, do it without notes. Okay, and this go back a second time, maybe in a different color, so that you can clearly see what you haven't processed and what you have processed. Use your notes to fill in whatever gap is missing. Okay. Um, go through the epidermis, go through the dermis, membranes, and glands. Questions with these? Okay. So here's an example of a cognitive map. So make a drawing, okay, and then see if you can label it. So again, you can see this is very similar to your worksheet, right? Make a cognitive map, label it, and See if you can identify the functions and the characteristics. Know the layers and then what cells go into each of those layers. Okay. Questions?
Any requests? Anything you want me to go through? I've pretty much covered the main, all the chapters. Is there anything that I covered that you want me to go through in more detail? How's the review session going? Is it helpful? The main difference between epithelial and connective. Okay, I love questions. So let's go back to tissues. Okay, so if you have epithelial and you have connective here, we can look at the difference in specific tissue type. We can look at the difference in characteristics. And we can look at the difference in components. Okay. So as you mentioned, a practice quiz, are they provide or are we to make them on your own? Um, so the practice quiz that I said at the very beginning, that practice quiz is only like four questions, five questions, and just generically on like the syllabus content. And that's just to make sure that um, the your computer setting is able to handle the respondents locked down and the webcam. Um, the practice quiz that we're going to cover at the end is ones that I've already that I use for my class, uh, my in-person class. Uh, so we'll do that. But it's not a bad idea, Alicia, to make your own sample test questions. Okay, now that you've seen the quizzes um, that you've taken and so on. Okay, so Faye, I'll get I'll get to you, but let me finish going through the difference between epithelial and connective first. So let's start with the characteristics. So in the characteristics, you know that epithelial tends to be what? A vascular. There's not a lot of blood vessels where connective tend to be vascular. Okay. Epithelial tends to be very densely packed with cells, where connective can be from, it, it ranges from loose to dense. Okay, and where epithelial is mainly cells, connective has cells, they have types of fiber, and they have types of ground substance. Okay, and that's in the components too. So epithelial is mainly cells where connective have these three components in their tissue type. Okay, and then here, the tissue type, this is where you would put the classification. So epithelium is classified based on whether it's one layer or multiple layer. It's also classified based on shape. Is it cuboidal? Is it squamous? Is it columnar? Where connective tissue happens to be named based on the components as well. What kind of cell do they have? What kind of ground substance do they have? And what kind of fiber do they have? So for example, if I tell you that this type of connective tissue has osteocytes as a cell, Ground substance is calcium phosphate, and fibers is collagen. What particular epithelial type am I talking? I'm sorry. What type? What particular connective tissue type am I talking about? Bone. Bone, exactly. Because bone has osteocytes, it has calcium phosphate as its ground substance, it has collagen as its fiber. So let's go to epithelial. So if I tell you that this type of epithelial has one layer of flat, thin cells, what would it be? Simple squamous. Simple squamous, excellent. Okay. So that's the difference between epithelium and connective and knowing that difference will allow you to identify what they are. Okay, so that was... 
a great question, Ariel. Um, Alicia, I think I answered your question. Faye, thank you for um, typing in that the differences. Yep, where one's vascular, one's avascular. Excellent. Anna, for the tissue portion, can you explain the nervous system? I had a previous question about the following in the nerve. Is the nervous system more numerous um, choices that were neurons, neuroglial dendrites, which are composed in the nervous system? I got it right based on guess, but can you elaborate more? Yes. So let me do another one. Okay. So within the nervous system, okay, you have neurons, neuroglial. Oh, oh shoot, my battery's low. Okay. Neuroglial, okay, and then dendrites. I think you said those were the options. So the dendrites you would find on the neurons. So the question is usually neurons versus neuroglials. Okay, which one is more abundant? So the neurons are the main nerve cells. And the neuroglial are the supportive cells. So for example, one neuron could have tons of neuroglial cells on top of it. Like for example, these are the Schwann cells. So knowing that, which one would be more abundant, neurons or neuroglial? Neuroglial. Yeah. And I think, and I may not remember this correctly, but I think for every one neuron, there's like a hundred neuroglials. Okay. All right. So um, how to prepare for lab, use the PDF. Oh, my, uh, my pen's no longer working. So let me plug that back in. Okay. So for lab, use the PDF. Listen to the video, write the correct answers on your PDF, and then use your PDF as a quiz. Okay. So I noticed that when I was reading your um this class's materials, a lot of students struggled with the spelling. So I'm wondering if you're studying, you're only reading it out to yourself and not actually practicing writing it out. So when you're doing these with the PDF, um, if you use the PDF as like a quiz itself and actually have another sheet that where you can write down the answers. So the more you practice not only identifying, but also writing it out, that would help with your spelling, okay? For lecture, the PowerPoints, the videos, and in terms of studying, writing your notes. You know, when I ask students every year what was the most helpful for them, they say writing their notes, okay? So not taking the notes when you were studying and listening to the videos, but actually rewriting them. Um, because that's just, it helps you remember it and it helps you organize the content in a way that you can recall it easily. Using the cognitive maps also helps. Um, just whatever you do, just don't just read. If all you're doing is reading, you, you won't be able to remember. It's just too much information to remember it. You have to figure out a way to organize it. Like if I were to give you thousands of pieces of paper, you won't be able to remember everything on them. But if you if you filed those pieces of paper into folders, then you'll go, oh, okay, these pieces of papers are, you know, for insurance. This These pieces of papers are for my health care. These pieces of paper are for schooling for my kids. So that categorizing and organizing the information, that's what you're doing when you're rewriting your notes, doing the cognitive maps, and that's what's going to help you remember. Okay? Always test yourself. Take um, do self-test test taking and so on. So like all of these strategies I put onto the announcements page, if you haven't had a chance to go through that, make sure you do it. 